worship, and this is when you see things, you're going to see little slogans and a little this, a little that, and a little the, the others. And on the website, you'll see something like this, worship. We believe worship is a lifestyle of giving to God the glory, honor, and praise he deserves. Right? And then a little, little taggy onto that, so we'll remember that, is life is worship. Worship's not just something we do here or do there or do during the Sunday morning service. Our whole life should be about worship and worshiping God with everything that we do and say. And then there's prayer. We believe prayer is simply communicating with our Heavenly Father. Sometimes we try to make prayer more complicated than what it should be. We try to make prayer something that um, is, or I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. But our little hashtaggy thing to that one is just simply amen. So when you hear amen, you know we're talking about the, the, uh, the core value that we, uh, of prayer. So here's the thing. We desire to be a church of prayer and sincere worship. Now, I'm not going to have you to raise your hands. When's the last time you got on the website, went to our prayer page, prayer request page, looked at the people who need to be prayed for and prayed for them? Don't raise your hand, and I'm not dogging you because I don't know who you are. Only you and God knows. See, there's the key. God knows. You try to trick me. Well, you can't let the preacher know. <laughs> try to trick your neighbor. We don't want the neighbors to know what we do over here. But you can't fool God. He knows. So my encouragement to you is start going to the website. By the way, how many of you have seen our new website? Good, all 10 of you. It is so exciting. <laughs> I am so pumped up. We've got a brand new website, and it's really, a, it's really a really good website. Ian has done tremendous work with it and on it, and it's, it's turned out really, really good. It's a lot better than the old one. I promise you that. But if you, uh, I did the old one, okay? I want you to know. But if you'll get on the website, there will be a place that you can go for prayer, requ prayer requests. And that's going to be listed things in our church family, people who are needing your prayers. If we're not praying for one another, I don't get it. So I'm going to ask you next week, and I may have you to raise your hand. How many of you this week went on, on the, onto the website? Go on there. It'll take you 15 seconds. See who needs to be prayed for and pray for them and then click it off. That's all you have to do. Will you do that for me? Okay. Hurry up. We want to get to lunch soon. Look, here's what I think about that. <laughs> Distractions. Now, whoever sent that to me, you know who you are. But better yet, God knows who you are. I may pray the bears down on you or something. I don't know. Where was I? See how easily we get distracted? If you've got my brain, a fly flies in front of me, and I forget where I was. I was going to be nice to you today, but there's a good chance I'm not going to when it's all said and done. Anyway, we desire to be a, that thing is off. We desire to be a church of prayer and sincere worship. We should be. And when I say sincere worship, we'll get to that in a moment, but it's more than just singing. It's a lifestyle. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, go there for me. It's one of the shortest verses in the Bible, but it's got a lot of power to it. And it simply says this, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without what? Without ceasing. Let's memorize that together. Don't look at it. Say it with me. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, say it. Pray without ceasing. You just memorized a verse. Don't tell me you can't memorize. Pray without ceasing. The Christian life is a life that is to be lived in constant communication with God. Too many people, you know, we talk about Bible studies, and we talk about reading God's Word, and, we, and we'll get to that later on uh, in, a, in a few weeks. But we talk about all these things, and here's what I hear more than anything. You just don't understand how busy I am. And I just want to lovingly tell you to get over yourself. You're not the only busy person in the world. But when the Bible says pray without ceasing, that means an attitude of prayer that while you're busy doing whatever it is you're doing, you can be communicating with God, right? Right? You don't have to have a special time or a special place. It's not something we call, uh, you know, we, we call a group to, to, together for corporate prayer. And yes, we, we should do that more often. But you don't have to wait for those times. God is always ready and willing to hear from his children. And waiting many times, I do believe. 
So I want to encourage you to learn this. Pray without ceasing. Have an attitude of prayer. Drive down the road praying. Get up in the morning praying. Go to work praying. Doing your job praying. What better way to do your job than communicating with, with your Heavenly Father? And then there's Psalm 29, verse 2. And some of these I'm going to go quickly. I'll get to a passage here in a minute so we can stay there. But Psalm 29, verse 2 says this. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. Today we're talking about prayer and we're talking about worship. We're told to pray without ceasing, to be in a constant attitude of prayer. And then we're told also that, that the Lord is, we should be giving Him the glory that is due to His name. That's worship. Because He is holy, Right? Do you realize how much the Lord loves you? We all have a reason to worship the Lord, every one of us. So we're going to look at a few things, what prayer is. Number one is communication with God. Communication, talking. How many of you know how to talk? I hope we don't have any people in here who can't talk. If we do, I'm not, I don't mean <laughs> How many people in here know how to communicate with other people? How many? How many are afraid to raise your hand? Okay. Prayer to God is simply talking to God. It's just simply talking to God. And here's the problem, I think. How many of you don't like talking to strangers? Be honest. Sometimes God's a stranger to us. And so it's hard to talk to him. Man, I don't know what to say. What do you mean you don't know what to say? You just talk to him. Tell him how wonderful he is. Tell him how much you love him. Tell him thanks for the things that he's done for you. Tell him thanks for your life. Tell him thanks for salvation. Tell him thanks for this, that, and the other. Just talk to him. Communicate with him. Driving down the road sometimes, turn the radio off, turn the stereo off, and talk to God. Just tell him how incredible he is. And that's also worship when we're worshiping him through, God, you're awesome, you're wonderful, you're beautiful, you're kind, you're everything that's good. I'm blessed to be able to call you my father. So it's simply communicating with God, conversing with our Creator. And He desires communication with His children, right? Right? Work up, people. So prayer is communication with God. Prayer is asking for things. How many of you know how to ask for things? Again, you can fool me. So come on, let's play, play along here. How many of you know how to ask for things? How many of you enjoy asking for things? Why not? How many of you get everything you ask for? <laughs> but you always get an answer when you talk to God. Always. James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. James says this, he says, You desire and you do not have, so you murder, you covet, and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. Then he goes on to say this, very important to understand. You do not have because you do not ask. You ever heard somebody say this? Maybe you've said this. Well, you know, it's kind of trivial. I hate to bother God with my trivial requests. Please understand, he's so big and we're so small, everything about us is trivial or could be trivial to him, but it's not. Everything about us compared to God is very small. It's almost minute. But God cares about his children. How many of you are parents? How many of you care about your children? Fewer hands. How many of you want your children talking to you? Sure you do. Now, I know there are times you wish they'd be quiet, but I'm talking about just, just the good conversation. How many of your children ask you for things? All the time. God is, His Word is saying it's okay to ask for things. We have not because we ask not. But here's the problem. James goes on to say, you ask and you do not receive because... You ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. And many times we're just constantly bombarding with God. God, give me. God, give me. God, let me win the lottery and I'll do this. He knows better. God, let me win the lottery and I'll buy CLC a new church. I've heard that a bunch of people. He knows better and maybe you will. But what about the rest of it? What are you going to do with it? I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to go out and buy your new home. Two or three new cars. You're going to get the kids everything that they don't need and many times don't deserve. And you're going to spend it many times. People are going to spend it on their own desires and their own passions. But that's what we do often. We ask God for things and because we want them. 
And so we don't receive them, and we wonder why. I don't have it on the screen, but we read in James 5.16 that the prayer of a righteous person, person is powerful. You want your prayers to make a difference? You want to know that God is hearing and answering your prayers? Then be a righteous person. James says that those prayers are powerful. They availeth much. And I want us to be a church of powerful prayer. I think sometimes it's just a side note. You know, Tom came up last week and scared me as he was walking up here. But uh, asked, you know, who would, who would come and pray with us in the morning? And we're sincere with that. We should be praying. There are times that some of the women will come in early and they'll just walk through and they'll just pray over all the chairs and stuff. That's an awesome thing. Let's not take Sunday morning for granted and let's not just do it because it's time to do it, but let's really be praying. Because there are times there are people sitting in these chairs who do not have a personal love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? We need to be praying for them. There are times in here, and I guarantee you this morning, there are people in here with heavy hearts. Guaranteed. We need to be praying for them. There are people in here who are sick. We need to be praying for them. And we can all pray. And I want to encourage you. Get here early. Pray. Walk around the building. Walk through the building. Go into the kids' rooms and pray over the kids' rooms. We just take things for granted. They're okay back there. She's got plenty of workers. Everything's going to be fine. But there are kids back there who are going to grow up to be adults. And we need to be praying for them now. Don't wait till they get up to the age and then start praying for them because now they're out of control or you're concerned about their salvation or whatever. Let's start praying for them now. Let's be praying for the people who are going to present themselves to these children, to, to teach them, to train them, to lead them. We need to be praying for them. So I want to encourage us to be a church of prayer and a church of worship. Here's some requests I've heard this past week or so, okay? Now play along with me. You'll pick up real quickly what I'm talking about. Honey, you need to mow. Honey, will you fix the faucet? Honey, will you clean up that nasty bathroom? I'm talking about mine. <laughs> Honey, will you take my car to the shop? Honey, will you empty the dishwasher? Honey, will you replace the water heater? Honey, will you go to the bank? These are things I've heard over the past week and a half or so. Now, what if that's all I heard from Alice over that period of time? Think about it. What kind of relationship would we be having? Number one, I'd already be fed up with her. All you want me to do is do, do, do. Right? Come on, you know what I'm talking about here. If your relationship in your home is just a bunch of asks, will you do this, you need to do that, honey, get in there and fix me some food, honey, will you make sure you get my clothes clean, please stop messing up my, my clothes, you know, do them right, which she doesn't mess up my clothes, that would be her talking to me. But if that's all you ever heard in a relationship, the relationship is not going to be what you want it to be, is it? What if, in between the requests, Honey, will you? Honey, you need to. Honey, I need you to do this. What if in between the requests I heard a lot of I love yous? You're the greatest. I'm blessed to have you as my husband. I'm so thankful for you. Let's not make any plans this weekend so we can just spend time together. What if I'm hearing those throughout the honey, will you? Honey, can you? Honey, you need to? It's going to make the will yous, can yous, and you need to is a whole lot easier, isn't it? Because along the way, there's been the adoration. There's been the love. There's been the sweetness. There's been the gentleness. There's been the kindness. And that's the same way it is when we communicate with God. We think prayer is just constantly asking God for stuff. And he tells us to ask for stuff. But somewhere along the way, we need to praise him and adore him and to worship him and to lift him up and to tell him how wonderful of a father he truly is. Don't we? Makes it a whole lot sweeter. God wants our request, but he also wants our worship and our, and our adoration. And we've got to be a church that not only prays, but a church that worships. Let's be a church that does this right. And it's not hard. Bow your heads. Bow your heads. And, you know, I, I, I hate when people tell me how to pray, but I'm going to tell you how to pray. Just say something like this, God, you're wonderful. Say it. Can you say it out loud? God, you're wonderful. God, will you bless our day today? 
God, you're beautiful. I thank you that you're my father. I'm so blessed to have you. You're awesome. God, will you bless our family? Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I don't know what, what attitude, hard attitude you prayed that with. Maybe you're just following along because I told you to. I don't know. But here's the thing. God knows your heart. Right? And that's all that matters. Right? We need to learn to be people of pray, praying. We need, to be learn, uh, we need to learn how to be people of worship and adoration. Psalm 95, verse 6. You know, prayer is also worshiping. Psalm 95, 6 says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Do you realize that you have the right and the privilege of going before the Lord anytime you want to? Do you realize that? I know some of you grew up in different uh, uh, denominations or different churches or whatever, and uh, some of you may have been taught that you had to pray to a priest or you had to go before Mary and pray through Mary or whatever. May I tell you this? That is not in the Scripture. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You can boldly go before the throne of grace because Jesus is our high priest. He's the only priest that we have to pray through. You don't need a preacher. You don't need a priest. You don't need Mary to enter the throne room of God. You just need to have a hard attitude of prayer and go before the Father. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. Who is that? It's Jesus himself. He is our mediator. He is our high priest. He is the one that goes before us. And the Holy Spirit, when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit takes what's in our heart and he takes it to the Father. So there's no reason for us not to be praying because we can. We have the opportunity. Worship, what is it? Worship is God-centered, first of all not man-centered. We spend too much time worshiping everything and everybody. Some of you worship stuff more than you worship God. It should not be. Some of you may worship the person that you're married to more than you worship God. It should not be. Some of you worship your children more than you worship God. It should not be. You say, well, no, we don't. That's foolish. Then I say, how do you spend your time? We need to be worshiping God, right? Right? Now, this is not a pump-up message. This is not to get you jumping up and down, shouting, hollering, yelling message. It's a very simple message. And it's really, it's really loving God 101. Talk to him and worship him. Some of the ways we can worship him is through the things that we do, through the things that we say, through the ways that we act, through the way that I treat my spouse, my wife through the way that you treat your kids. That can be worship. How you treat your job, that can be worship. Being thankful for it, praising God for it. I tell you this all the time. Stop moaning and groaning about your job and say, God, thank you for this job that I don't like. Right? It'll be better when you realize that God allowed you to have that job and God is providing for you through that job that you don't necessarily like. And if you hate it that much, go find you another job. But quit moaning, groaning, and complaining. It's time for us to stop moaning and groaning and complaining. It's time. Stop it. I told you last week, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. If you've got issues and we need to talk, come to me. But if you just want to come moan, groan, and complain, go somewhere else. But you can't be moaning and groaning and complaining and worshiping at the same time. You can't do it. James talks about bitterness and, and sweetness coming out of the same water. You can't do it. And I want to encourage us to be people who pray, but also people who praise and worship. And when you're down, when you feel like you're beat down, then you need to turn to God and allow Him to strengthen you and realize who you are in Christ. Worship focuses on God and His greatness, not on man. Stop putting your focus and your worship on the things of the world and put it on God. You call yourself a child of God. That's what he wants from us. 
in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, a very familiar passage to most. We're going to read it together. This passage, I think, contains all the elements of true worship. Romans chapter 12, verse 11 says, Paul's talking. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that, you may, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. First, there's the motivation to worship, the mercies of God. When's the last time you thought about the mercies of God in your life? When's the last time? God's mercies are everything he's given us that, he, that we don't deserve. I'm just going to read you off a bunch of things here, so keep up. Eternal love, eternal grace, the Holy Spirit, everlasting peace, eternal joy, saving faith, comfort, strength, wisdom, hope, patience, kindness, honor, glory, righteousness, security, eternal life, forgiveness, reconciliation, justification, sanctification, freedom, and so much more. The mercies of God. Do you have anything to be thankful for? Do you have anything to be worshiping him for? Did I mention anything in there that fits you? Then by the mercies of God, we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. You see, the knowledge and understanding of these incredible gifts motivate us to pour forth praise and thanksgiving. In other words, worship. We all have something to be thankful for, right? Are you a child of God? Are you a child of God? Do you know if you drew your last breath this moment that you're going to be, spend eternity with the Lord himself? Then you have everything to be thankful for. And you have every reason to worship. And you have every reason to talk to your heavenly father. Because he desires it from us. Also in the passage is a description of the manner of our worship. To present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Presenting our bodies means giving God all of ourselves. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Remember the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And so when we are giving him, presenting our bodies to him as living sacrifices, then what we're saying is, here God, I'm yours. Do with me as you wish. That's worship. And that's what we need to be doing. Then there's by the renewing of your mind. We renew our minds daily by cleansing them of the world's wisdom and replacing it with true wisdom that comes from God. James says if you lack wisdom, do what? Ask God and he'll do what? He'll give it to you. And upbraideth not, he won't hold it against you. He'll give, you, he'll give it to you. He wants you to ask for wisdom. Some of you need to ask for wisdom. And he says he'll give it. We worship him with our renewed and cleansed minds, not with our emotions. Emotions are wonderful things, but unless they're shaped by a mind saturated in truth, they can be destructive and out of control forces. You ever seen an emotional person? Woo! Oh, by the way, Ian gets the emotional people too. <laughs> Just trying to break you in, buddy. Emotions can go wild on you, can't they, women? Oh, you know you're more emotional than men. That's, a, that's a, just a fact. When men get emotional, they're just, oh, they're hard to deal with. They get all cry and blubbery and stuff, you know, they just snot and all this and cry. <laughs> but you women sometimes, you get emotional, you get mean. And you don't get so all whacked out that you can't, we can't understand what you're saying. You let us know what you're saying. But emotions will lie to you sometimes, won't they? They will. They're wonderful things, but they've got to be shaped by a mind saturated in truth. Where the mind goes, the will follows. And so do the emotions. 1 Corinthians 2.16 tells us we have the mind of Christ, not the emotions of Christ. So we've got to be careful. Renewing our mind, getting beyond the, the emotions. Also, music can't produce worship, but it can't produce emotion, can it? We could get you up here rocking. We could get you back and forth. We could get you throwing your hands. We could get you running around the, around the building if we wanted to. Guaranteed, most of you, not all of you. 
we could work on your emotions. And that's why I think it's so important that when we get into to the music part of, of what we call worship, that we're not trying to work you into something. Because many times it's not real. Oh, it feels good, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It feels good to go to those concerts with 30,000, 40,000 people and you're just all just yelling and shouting and jumping and bouncing and head banging and flopping that hair and stuff. And it feels really good and you're having a good time, but then tomorrow all you've got is a sore neck. Or you're hoarse and you can't talk. Or you're just worn out and you just don't feel like doing anything. Worship is not about emotions. It's not about working it up. Music's not the origin of worship, but it can be an expression of it. Don't look to music, music to induce your worship. Look to music as simply an expression of that which is induced by a heart that is wrapped by the mercies of God, obedient to his commands. There's only one way for us to renew our minds. And that's through the word of God. Hello? The word of God. The world can't renew your mind. The world will mess it up. The things of the world cannot give you what you need. That's why God's word says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. True worship is not confined to what we do in church or open praise, all those, these things are good. And the Bible tells us to do them. But true worship is the acknowledgement of God and all his power and glory in everything that we do. That's true worship. God, you're wonderful. When's the last time you said that? Except when I told you to earlier. God, you're awesome. God, I can't live without you. God, you deserve my very best, and I want to give it to you. When's the last time you made that comment? And then I'm going to be done here. Turn to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Because I believe that there's one word that truly ties prayer and worship together. And if prayer and worship are going to be things that we value as a church, we need to learn how to pray, and we need to learn how to worship. But it's not something that we can teach you how to do. It's something that you learn to do the more time you spend with God and the more time you spend thinking about who he is and about his wondrous love for you and his glorious mercies and all the things that he's done and he's going to do. But here's, there's one word I think that ties these two together. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything. Stop stressing. Stop trying to fix things on your own. Stop trying to play God. You can't do it. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, we're told to pray. You have not because you ask not. We're told to pray. In everything by prayer and supplication with what? I think that's the key word right there. If I have a thankful heart, then it's a lot easier for me to talk to my father. If I have a thankful heart, then it's a lot easier for me to worship him and tell him how wonderful he is and how thankful and grateful I am of all the things that he's done for me and all the things that he's given to me. But by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, and here's what I love about these verses, the peace of God. How many of you want the peace of God in your life? I want it daily, moment by moment. That's what I desire. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, a thankful heart knows how to pray, and a thankful heart knows how to worship. And if we're a church that believes in prayer, it's time for us to start praying. If we're a church that believes in worship, it's time for us to learn how to worship. And again, I don't mean through the songs and the music. That's great. I'm talking about a life style. I'm talking about an attitude of a heart. Let's learn how to worship. And let's be thankful. Thankfulness brings the peace of God into your life. Hey, next time you have a hard time, see Daryl back there. We lost our brother this week. But it was easy to give thanks because we knew that Carrie knew Jesus. It'd be easy to get down, and thank you for those of you who have said kind words, but it'd be easy to get down and, oh, well, well it's awful. But we knew that he knew the Lord. As I talked to him the other day, he was assuring me, reassuring me that I don't have to worry. He's ready to go. 
So it's easy to say thank you, Lord. It's easy to give praise and worship even in times of tough times. If we're focusing on God and his mercy and his glory and his power and his love and his forgiveness and his promise of eternal life. We all have something to look forward to if we are children of God. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, none of this applies to you yet. But today it can. Let's bow our heads.